The best thing I hope my lab does on their best day is taking these ideas from deep philosophy that people have argued about for thousands of years and bringing them to the bedside, to the clinic. What you look like and where you come from simply cannot be the foundation for how we're going to relate to each other. I don't feel in any way diminished by the idea that there are an infinitude of other minds, highly diverse minds, um, endless sentient forms that are also having experiences that strive and suffer to various degrees. I think what we have is essential. I yeah, would like uh, humanity to scale its cognitive capacity more specifically, not just the intelligence, but the radius of concern, of care, and uh, of, of compassion. I think we need to scale that up. The amount of emails that I get every day from people with the most unbelievable examples of biomedical suffering is just incredible. So I think it is utter uh, moral cowardice to focus on what we shouldn't do, as opposed to our duty now that we have, for the first time, we have the ability to actually rationally uh, approach these matters to try to guarantee a better embodiment for sentient beings on Earth. Cool. Well, good morning, Mike. How are you? Good morning. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful get, to get the chance to talk to you. I'm a very much an amateur in this field, but I've admired your work for a long while. And um, I can't offer you the size of audiences you're used to with your TED Talk and with some of the other interviews you've given. But I can trade that for quality because my audience might be small, but they're lovely and deeply thoughtful. So I'm sure they'll appreciate your great. work and your thinking. So it's great to have you here. Um, and I think you're probably in nearly 200 episodes, my first full on biologists, which is a gap I should have filled long ago, because there's this sense that you know, maybe the mathematicians look down on the messiness of science, and maybe even the physicists look down on the mess of chemistry and biology. But I think the hierarchy goes the other way. I think biology is the, the harder, more challenging space, whereas the mathematicians and the physicists with their spherical cows can abstract some of the interesting stuff away. You, you up to your elbows in it quite often. So it's great to get the chance to have a biology focused conversation. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, we, we biologists have plenty of spherical cows. Uh, you know, we, we, a lot of people uh, talk about uh, some of our constructs as real, you know, pathways and things like this, but you know, of course, these are all, these are all imaginary kinds of constructs that we do our best with. So. Yeah, cool. Um, so this is a series of conversations about what I think of as the deepest philosophical questions and also the most important. And they're questions of what's real, really more epistemology than ontology. You know, how should we go about best understanding this crazy world we all share? But just as importantly, the questions of ethics. And within that complex field, the simple question of who gets to count, right? who should we count as another as we're thinking about how to lead a good life. And I have an obvious bias because this sentientism worldview I'm trying to popularize and develop is very pluralistic and very broad, but in a sentence is evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So when we're answering the what's real and how to understand the universe question, it suggests a really broad, humble, naturalistic approach that uses evidence and reasoning. And when it comes to the ethical scope question, the clue is in the name. It says that all sentient beings, any being that has the capacity to experience things, to flourish, to suffer, should count at least to some minimal regard in a moral consideration. But I'm talking to people in this series of conversations, some of whom agree and some of whom don't. So it'll be interesting to see how you have gone through your own philosophical journey and answering those questions, where you are now and how that runs through the work you do today. Uh, but before we get on to those big questions, how would you best introduce yourself for uh, those people in my audience who haven't come across your work so far? Well, let's see. Uh, so my name is Mike Levin. I'm a, a professor at Tufts University. I run the Allen Discovery Center here at Tufts. I'm also the uh, an affiliate um, uh, faculty member at the, the Wies Institute at Harvard. Um, I do a number of other things. Uh, I, I co-direct the uh, ICDO, the, the, the Institute for Computer Designed Organisms with Josh Bongard. Um, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's me. I study uh, I study a range of things. Uh, I mean, we'll we'll get into all the details, but uh, you know, in my group here, uh, we we do a combination of uh, biology or or biophysics, mostly um, computer science and cognitive science to understand embodied minds. That's really what we do. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll dig in. We'll dig in. So let's start with the first of these big philosophical questions: the question of what's real and epistemology. Quite often, an interesting way into that space because it's so broad. It covers you know anything we might choose to believe or have credences in. But an interesting way in for many of my guests is to talk about their journey with respect to religion and spirituality and whether they grew up in a religious, spiritual sort of context and household, whether they held on to those types of beliefs or, or not. 
and how that side of their thinking about some of the sort of ultimate questions of the nature of reality might have shifted since. But so I don't know if you want to wind the clock back and sort of tell, a, tell us your story in that space. And then we could get into, I guess, more of the field of science and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my background, uh, I think you could say is, uh, not religious, but highly spiritual. So, uh, you know, I went for, for a few years, I went to a, uh, to a, a, a Hebrew day school and, um, and, you know, my, my, uh, my background from that perspective is, is Jewish and, and, and we, st you know, we, we studied, uh, some, uh, some, some thoughts around, uh, around, around that, that, that whole thing. Uh, you know, and I and I harassed everybody with questions about um, what happens in conjoint twinning and how uh, you know how souls are supposed to work and how they solve the the, the problems of uh, you know the hard problem of consciousness and all that 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 kind of a thing. And you know those the the an answers weren't terribly forthcoming um, from from that direction. But um, in my in my home, uh, I think it was always very clear from the time I was very young that uh, we had an emphasis on. Uh, on inquiry, um, on asking big questions, on uh, making sure that uh, whatever we spend energy on is uh, towards things that matter in an, in, a, in an ethical way. You know, I was always encouraged to to find things um, that I'm passionate about and to and to use uh, intellect and and every every other tool uh, at at my disposal to sort of get to the bottom of things. So so we had we had lots of um, lots of deep uh, conversations about um, kind of the big questions and and how how they might be addressed. You know the question: How do you know? Uh, what figured prominently uh, in my in my childhood? Um, I was always encouraged to think about those kinds of things. So that, in the way I'm describing that naturalistic epistemology of using evidence and reason and sort of thinking things through, and that inquiry was there from quite an early age, even within a family that sat within a broader sort of religiously defined community and culture. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but uh, but also to be clear that. Um, you know, there are there are many ways of of uh, of enhancing wisdom, uh, or at least attempting to. And so, rationality is is an, an amazing tool. But but one can also ask questions about its limitations and what other alternatives might be on offer. And you know, uh, making sure that we understand what what are the things that we're not seeing. You know, and and it's sort of there's a, there's an old saying that says show show me the net with which you're fishing, and I'll tell you what you're not going to catch. I forget who who said it, but that's you know that that um, being uh, having that level of skepticism about the approaches you bring to a problem, whether that be different kinds of uh, logic or or whatever else, you know that that was always emphasized as well. Yeah, and that and that if your if your choice of evidence or your choice of methods are too narrow, that can become its own dogma. As you say, you've got to be able to question those, you know those choices too and part of the re part of the way i try and counter that is to talk about evidence and reason in a very broad sense so some people will think of that as being a narrowly rational or empiric or even a scientific process that you know it doesn't count as evidence until, until you've done a randomized control trial and i don't think of it in those terms at all i think of evidence and reason in a very broad open sense that can include the experience from our senses our subjective experience and, you know, however weird those might be. I think those are all types of evidence too. We can be skeptical of them, but I think that broad conception of naturalism is something I'm much more comfortable with than something that's really narrowly scientific, if you like, which can, yeah. I think, narrow, narrow down too, too tightly. And, and how, how did that in sense of inquiry, but a broad sense of inquiry, shift your actual beliefs over time? Did even when you were asking the awkward questions, did you still hold on to some of the supernatural beliefs anyway? Have those shifted over time? So I guess there's, there's probably two linked questions there. How do you think about the, the possibility of some of those supernatural constructs now, gods and souls and spirits? And is your sense of those still linked to this inquiry and a naturalistic approach? Or do you sort of reserve certain areas of knowledge for different epistemologies that might be more faith-based or revelatory yeah i mean i think that to me to i i i pretty much i think i pretty much only have one supernatural belief which is that the universe is understandable in some fashion whatever that may mean to be un, to, to be understood and that we are uh at least to some extent capable of resonating with a uh, fundamental principles that that guide its development and therefore a knowledge seeking and uh and things like this are not hopeless that that i fully admit is a supernatural belief because that's the kind of thing you can't really um get behind but once but once you've taken that on then uh everything else becomes possible so i don't think anything i i can't think of anything that would be truly supernatural in the sense that it might be completely outside of 
current abilities to understand, maybe maybe beyond current scientific formalisms, but also perhaps beyond our uh, our cognitive capacities, right? So so all of us are finite beings. Guaranteed, there are going to be things that we are simply not capable of comprehending as well as we can comprehend other things. And so beyond that, uh, I don't think anything is is really supernatural. I think all of us uh, are doing our best in um, cobbling together uh, some kind of uh, understand some kind of coherent understanding of the world and our place in it. And then the interesting empirical part is then you get to find out how well it's working for you. So not just in the narrow scientific sense of specific paradigms that help you do experiments and make predictions and things like that, but the same idea applied to one's life. And so, so you have various outlooks that you might take on various frameworks, and then you have to ask yourself, so, so how, how is this working out? You know, is this, is this helping me have a more meaningful life? Is it helping me, um, be a more, uh, more ethical person to have better relationships with others? Um, uh, you know, th those are the kinds of things that are not specifically sort of scientific outcomes, but the process is exactly the same. You, you examine your framing and you ask yourself, could I, are there ways to tune that framing to, to, to do better, to have a better experience with others? Yeah. Thank you. And I quite like describing this naturalistic approach as being just a an attempt to honestly engage with reality in an attempt to understand it. And that understanding will always be partial and probabilistic and provisional and uncertain and open to revision. But I guess that that's an interesting way of putting it. It's not just about, you know, does the evidence start with my hypothesis? It's just, it's also how does the application of this knowledge or these beliefs actually work for me in practical terms, right? whether they're my life or engineering context. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It became, it became pretty clear early on that, how one looks at uh, at the data or at life or at anything else is a very strong determinant of how um, one is going to interpret everything that happens. And and these kind of frames are uh, they they drive uh, what happens next, and they drive the kinds of uh, the kinds of things that become possible for you or impossible. You know, they they determine um, uh, what which things are facilitated and which things are are constrained. And so that that aspect of it being really being really um, in control of, of of how you interpret things, I think I think is 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 really important. Yeah, thank you. Um, and if we narrow down now, I think of I guess the scientific pursuit as being a subset of naturalism. It's the sort of a formalized way of doing that. And um, your focus is in the field of biology, and it's been it's fascinating because I think for most people with their memory of the sort of high school sense of what biology is involved in you've been taking the field in very different ways although some of those different ways have quite old roots too how have you come to understand biology as a field writ large and what are the sort of distinctive angles that you've been trying to develop particularly as you think about one of the you know introductory comments on your lab's website talks about this fascination with the fact that all of us have gone from matter to mind in some sense yeah. Uh, I don't really think of myself as a biologist. Uh, I, I mean, we certainly do biology in my in my lab, um, among among other things. But uh, my uh, fundamental uh, commitment in my in my career and my life basically has been to understand embodied mind. And so I've got this uh, mind map uh, that I print out every once. In, you know, I refresh it and pr print it out every once in a while, and it hangs in the in the lab, and it's you know about nine feet uh, nine feet wide. This big kind of poster thing, and in the middle of it, the 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 root node of this mind map is uh, is is says embodied mind. That's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in uh, uh, cognition, intelligence, uh, and um, inner perspective in a wide range of diverse systems, some of which we would call alive nowadays. I actually spend very little time uh, figuring out a definition of life, although if you want, we can we can talk about it, but I don't I don't worry about it too much at all. I'm, I'm interested in the things that all cognitive agents have in common. I'm interested in the scaling of mind from its uh, most um, uh, sort of uh, primitive and, and, and humble examples in the, in, the, in the world, which I don't think anybody would call alive necessarily, but I think, I think cognition is broader than life, a uh, broader category than life. Uh, and um, yeah, and that's, and that's what we're interested in now. Now, it just so happens that life is our best example of, uh, so far of how uh, that gets scaled. So we do a lot of work in our lab using the the phenomenon of molecular networks scaling into cells, scaling into tissues, uh, scaling into organisms, and and beyond, as an example of how to understand collective intelligence, how to communicate and ethically relate to those collective intelligences, 
um, where do the goals of those collective intelligences come from and and so on so biology is a is a is an excellent uh, playground for these kinds of things but i, I actually think the, the question is bigger than that yeah thank you and the again the sort of high school and when i talk about it in the third person it's really my high school <laughs> sense of these things it does reflect this sense that there are different scales of reality and you're interestingly trying to span them and work across them and look at some phenomena that may be scale free in some sense but i guess you can start you can think about the fundamentals of physics whether those are fields or you know fluctuations in them represented as particles and you can come up through the different layers um for our purposes i guess where it starts to get useful most people would think of life as being the point where you know we're getting into the realms of considering the possibility of mind at least there are entities that are separated from their environment that have some sort of evolutionary history that have some form of drive to live but you've hinted there already you don't necessarily find the concept of life that interesting but then you can move through you know simple types of life in the early evolutionary stages but also in the degree of complexity as well so in our current panoply of living beings you know very simple single-celled organisms plants and fungi and then it feels intuitively like we take another step on the cognition path when we're starting to think about animals as well so as we as we're sort of working across that boundary from non-life to very simple life through to plants fungi and the simplest animals where do you see this idea of cognition emerging where did it come from and i guess what is it but it's one of the things i find interesting in at least your public writing is that sometimes it does feel like there's a little bit of slippage in the term because sometimes it cognition feels like something that's more narrowly computational you know it's something that maybe my spreadsheet on a laptop could be doing but sometimes there is an implication of mind and a subjective perspective in the way you talk about cognition as well so i should ask a better question than that but in that sort of space of simpler living organisms how does cognition emerge and what do you think of it is in its simplest terms yeah so uh, so here's here's how i think about these things uh, the the all all of these cognitive claims uh, in other words uh where you think something is on the spectrum of cognition, you know, how much mind and all of that. I, I don't think these are terms describing particular systems. I think these are terms describing our intended relationship to them. So I don't think any of this is about the system itself. It's when you make a cognitive claim about something, uh, you say it's th this system is at the level of whatever, what you're really telling me is uh, an engineering interaction protocol. You're telling me what your viewpoint on that system is, and that viewpoint is going to determine how you interact with it. So I'll give you a simple example. Um, uh, people argue all the time about whether uh, whether humans are machines. You know, and now now this is a long conversation because you have to define machine, you have to define human, and all that. But you know, if 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 you have an orthopedic surgeon who does not believe you are a machine, you're in trouble. You need to you need to find a different orthopedic surgeon. If you have a spouse or a psychotherapist who thinks you're a simple machine, you're also in trouble. Not 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 a great not a great um, uh, fit there. And so there, there are plenty of supposed doctors out there who think you're a fluctuation in the cosmic quantum wave vibrations so yeah 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 <laughs> i mean so 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 my framework so, so i'm working on this framework called tame t-a-m-e technological approach to mind everywhere and 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 one of the main claims of this framework is that none of these things can be uh determined from a philosophical armchair you can't just decide what things are you have to do experiments so if you think you know you're, you're a quantum fluctuation whatever whatever that's that's great um it's all open it's it's a it's a fine hypothesis what has it done for you right like what what are the benefits and so and so i think this is this is the difference between you know this kind of pluralistic view that i have where multiple observers can differ as to their assessment of any given system that's 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 what i believe but it doesn't mean that anything goes because those observers can then uh compare well how well did that worldview work out for you what has that enabled you to do what has that enabled you to discover um how rich are your relationships with with the various systems given the view that you have so so what you want to do is you want to get it right or at least optimize it you don't want to have false negatives where you attribute uh, 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 cognitive qualities to systems that uh, where where they don't give you any any new purchase. So so for example, uh, you know kind of um, 
uh, old school animist ideas where there's a spirit in every rock. It's a fine hypothesis. What is, how, how, how has that worked out? You know, what does that do for you? You know, you, you need to do experiments and you need to show that, hey, by saying that this thing has goals, it has learning capacity, it has whatever, this is now what I'm able to do. I'm able to uh, either either make better con uh, prediction and control or we're having a more uh, richer, exper um, um, you know, interpersonal experience or something. So all of these things uh, need to be empirically testable. So in uh in 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 this framework your your spreadsheet may or may not be doing some of the things that uh are are tractable using the tools of cognitive science you, for a spreadsheet probably not but but you'd be surprised the, the the thing about the thing about treating these things as empirical questions not philosophy is that you are often surprised which is what is good about science is that when you re when you when you are surprised that that's an opportunity to learn and so what i think all of these cognitive claims really are are uh, uh, hypotheses about which set of tools am I going to apply? So am I going to apply the tools of physics and simple engineering? Am I going to apply the tools of cybernetics and control theory, the tools of behaviorism and uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, learning and training and things like that, or the tools of communication and and uh, say, you know, psychoanalysis and love and and all these other things. So, so, so the thing is that when you when you treat that as a uh, as an empirical question, you get to do experiments and you get to be surprised. So, for example, um, we have found that uh, very simple systems that uh, represent gene regulatory networks, so just uh, small numbers of of chemicals that turn each other on and off. That's it. No cell, no, you know, no, 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 um, uh, indeterminism, no magic, just, just differential equations of describing how, how genes turn each other on and off that system, which most people would assume is, uh, has, has zero uh, cognition. They would say, well, that's a very mechanical, you know, uh, it's just, as, as people say, it's just obeying the laws of, of physics and chemistry that, that turns There's out. There's a lot is, in that just. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I hate. I mean, I, I really hate that, that that framing, but that's what that's what people often say. That system by itself is capable of six different kinds of learning, including Pavlovian conditioning, just there. So with nothing wow. else, we've also done uh, we've also done work on um, sorting algorithms. So these are extremely simple, deterministic, uh, uh, fully transparent algorithms that people in computer science have been studying for I don't know sixty years of or not or longer. Things like bubble sort and so on. Even those things, when you when you probe them the right way show novel problem solving capacities and and behaviors that are not in the algorithm themselves so what i am taking from all of this is that we really need a sense of humility about what things can do and what um what kinds of tools are best appropriate for them you don't know we are we are not good at guessing we we, we think we are and people assume this all the time but we're not good at guessing and so we need a mature science so this is you know if i had to pick one field that I think I work in, it's diverse intelligence research. That's what I think we do. We uh, we are trying to develop principal frameworks for really knowing uh, which kinds of cognitive uh, tools, which scale of cognitive tools are appropriate for various systems. And 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 we and, and we're just we're just not very good at, at uh, guessing from the beginning. Yeah, thank you. And and intelligence, I think. I mean, again, you can we could spend three hours in talking about definitions of it, but I think many people would talk about it in simple terms as being the capacity to solve problems, which is something that could be done with without mind and without subjectivity and without feeling, whereas cognition, uh, or, mm. or maybe, again, you're going to tell me that these distinctions are maybe not even well well posed. Yeah. So, so let's, let's, okay, let's, let's break it down a little bit. So, so intelligence, I, I, I agree with you that a good definition of intelligence has to do with problem solving. Now I'm not claiming that problem solving encompasses everything that's interesting about cognition. There are yeah, okay. play exploration. There are, there are other things that are not about problem solving, but, but, but problem solving is good because it's, it's publicly observable. It's a good scientific thing to study. Um, and, and it's about, uh, competency in navigating some problem space. You know, and, and there are many, many tools and tricks that a system can use to navigate that um, that problem space. Now, now the thing about inner perspective is 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 this, which is, uh, uh, and 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 I'm not at this point. I'm not talking about uh, the hard problem of consciousness. We can sort of talk about that separately. But 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 the, here's the thing about inner perspective. Uh, it, it's not a binary. I don't think any of these categories are usefully binary. What I think is important about inner perspective is this. Uh, for for any kind of system, you want to be able to answer the question: How important 
is the system's perspective onto the world for me to understand what's happening. So let's make a, let's do, have a simple example. Uh, suppose you have a bowling ball on a, on a hilly landscape. So you've got this energy landscape, you've got bumps and valleys, and you've got a bowling ball. If you want to know what that bowling ball is going to do, your view as a, as a third party observer to this, as an external observer, your view of the landscape tells the whole story. Okay, there's nothing more. You don't need anything else. You 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 will have you will have uh, everything you need to to know to predict what's going to happen from your external view of the landscape. By the way, you don't need uh, to imagine what it's like to be the ball. Well, that's and, the uh, next. <laughs> well, well, that's the next step. That's the next step, which is that uh, if you want to now know what a mouse is going to do on that landscape, your view of that landscape isn't really very uh, interesting at all. It, the important thing, and it's not predictive of much. The important thing is the mouse's view of that landscape, because if it has an internal representation of, of, of the uh, valence of different portions of that landscape, so rewards and punishments and which things are important to it and what attention it's paying and all that. The, the inner landscape of the mouse is the actual landscape that's going to determine what happens next, not your view of the landscape. So, so different kinds of um, systems have different degrees of representation of their outside world. It's not just brainy, smart animals that do this. All systems represent the world to some extent. And the question is, how much? The question is, how much do I need to worry about? Uh, and, and, and one way to uh, sort of quantify this is in terms of the size of their cognitive light cone. So you can sort of ask for any given system, if you were to draw a, a, a space-time, it's sort of a butchering of Minkowski's space-time cone diagrams, you can, you can draw a little, a little diagram that says, what are the events both back in time and forward, because some systems anticipate, so both back in time and forward in time and spatially, what are the things you need to know? To, to, to have a really rich uh, relationship with the system, meaning, meaning prediction, control, uh, something that benefits you, and in some cases, something that's you know, ethical and all that. Um, what, what do you need to know? So for a bowling ball, the cognitive light cone is tiny, right? Because everything you need to know is right there. You add up all the pushes and pulls on it, you're, you're, you're more or less done. Uh, but once you start um, entering the um, systems that are even as simple as a collection of genes regulating each other, that's no longer satisfactory because, because they learn from experience and things that have happened before are going to make huge differences to what happens next. You, you cannot get, gain a full understanding of what's happening or, or to gain good control without understanding their inner perspective. So I think. Um, Inner perspective uh, is uh, is is something that, to some degree, is wider than biology. I think what biology is really good at is scaling up these cognitive light cones. So, you know, in a rock, the cognitive light cone of the pieces, which by the way is not zero, it's very small, but it is, but I don't think it's zero. Uh, is not really uh, summed up in the rock. You know, the rock has exactly the same level of cognitive light cone as its pieces. But biology is super good at. Uh, to say it another way, I think we call by we call living things any system that's good at scaling up the cognitive light cone of its parts. It's going to look alive to us, you know. And 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 just the final kind of thing, which you know we'll probably get to again later um, uh, in terms of uh, what kind of world we want to live in. I think that evolution is has no monopoly on producing in, uh, uh, cognition. In other words, up until now, yes, that's probably at least on Earth, that's probably mostly where cognition came from is from the from the fumblings of uh, of, of of mutation, of selection, and of some other some other things. But uh, I don't think intrinsically that's uh, that's that's where cognition has to come from. I don't see any reason whatsoever why the um, rational efforts of other cognitive agents, such as ourselves, couldn't make new minds, um, you know, going forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we we'll get to dig into that. And and the point you mentioned about the um, the approach to genetics is one of the things that you've helped to radicalize this view. You know, this simplistic view that DNA is some form of blueprint where you programmatically and linearly follow it. You know, that's one of the things, I, as I understand, your work has radically opened up. It's nowhere near that simple. It's much more about you know systems interacting and memory can be held in different forms and so on. So yeah, it's. it's um, broadened out that view and as we're sort of moving further up the scale if there is such a scale one of the things i've heard you resist before as you are here in a way is this idea of really clear binary concepts concepts like sentience and consciousness that try to take ideas like cognition and map them onto this intuitive sense that we have that we are ineffable, distinct, somehow unique entities that feel like we're set diff separate, we're not just physics. And, and um, I, I empathize with that resistance because I think there's a danger in 
that intuition that we I, that we that we reify these ideas because they're obviously important to us intuitively. I can understand why anyone's consciousness would be important to them. Ultimately, it's all they experience, right? And everything we experience comes through the consciousness. But there's a danger in reifying that and taking it away from just being physics because ultimately, I think I share your view that, you know, just physics, we are all just part of the natural world all the way down. It doesn't mean these aren't interesting concepts, but they're not distinct from physical reality. Um, but at the same time, I prefer not to put them completely to one side. And I think in the way you're describing, you know, needing some sort of research concept or some concept of relationality can still provide you know, at least a couple of reasons why it's important to still focus on ideas like sentience and consciousness. And I guess one, it came partly through my conversation with Mark Solms, who I know you spent a lot of quality time with. I've loved some of your discussions because part of the way he tells the story about evolution is that sentience, the capacity to actually experience a valence is one of the things that's probably driven the process of, of, of you know, broader cognition and evolution in the first place. So he puts that concept of, or the ability to feel things, feel good, feel good, bad, how am I doing now in this environment as, as quite central. And I guess that's the way I think of sentience as being just that capacity to have an experience and to value it from yourself, whatever yourself is. But I guess another reason, another potential research project links to our next question, which is that these things also seem to have some quite deep moral or ethical significance too, in that, you know, and we'll come, come back to that. But I guess those are two of the reasons why those sometimes problematic concepts, and I certainly don't think they're binary in any sense, there's still a drive for us to understand and 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 dig in. Yeah. So, what, what do you think about those sorts of challenges? About you know, is is there a because because you could go to a point of view where you never talk about sentience and consciousness or subjective experience in in those senses at all, and you stick purely with a more neutral description of cognition and agent spaces and Markov blankets. Do you feel an that there is some meaningful pull to delve into and better understand those ideas of sentience and consciousness in their own right, or how do you think? Yeah, of those? well, well I, I think those are those are essential. Um, my uh, my resistance to binary categories is not uh, to um, you know uh, kind of uh, reduce uh, these these aspects that you're talking about at all. It's to uh, on the contrary, it's to have a better understanding of them and their potential. You know, I, I get a lot of uh, pushback from both directions. So I get mechanistic, you know, sort of supposedly reductionist scientists who say, well, this is crazy. You're, 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 uh, you're, you know, you're, you're painting feelings onto, onto cells and chemistry is the best, is the, is the best kind of explanation. You know, and that's not really reduction is because then if you say, well, you mean quantum foam, you want to talk about quantum foam. They say, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not it. It's chemistry. It's got to be chemistry. So, so, you know, so, so they've picked, they've picked the level. Okay. Uh, but, but I also, but I also get a lot of flack from the organicists, uh, which, and I consider myself in the organicist tradition, but, but who say, look, by putting um, non-living things uh, such as uh physical objects and computers and whatnot on that somewhere on that spectrum, you're, uh, undermining this uh this 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 battle that we've had for hundreds of years to preserve the 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 magic and the and the importance of uh, of of life and of inner perspective and so on i i don't think understanding these things better and understanding how they scale up reduces the importance or the or the majesty of the obvious uh sentience of of living uh, living beings i think uh much like with any kind of science it helps us to understand what we are and what our potential is and what we need to do I think that um, this 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 weird obsession with with chemistry and with uh, and with physics too is uh, is 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 what um, undermines the efforts to really understand this. And I'll give you a simple example. Um, well, two examples. One is uh, I often I often hear people say this. Uh, that's not real you know, real um, goals, real uh, uh, preferences, real valence, real anything. That's just, uh, it's just following the laws of physics and chemistry. 
Well, guess what? If you, you know, if you, if you, if you were to zoom in to your brain or the rest of your body, guess what you would find? You wouldn't find fairies. You would find physics and chemistry. So, so it's and very. If you found fairies, they'd be following the laws of physics too. They're, they would have to be following okay. something, right? So, so I'm not against. Uh, if you have a model of, uh, you know, people sometimes email me. Uh, but what about the soul? I say, bring it on. If you've got a mo, uh, if you've got a model of the soul explain how that works and how that solves these problems and and we're good to go the problem is the, i've never seen such a model but the you know the question i i always bring it back to uh the paramecium you know or or a simple single cell do you or do you not believe that that thing has to small to some small extent a preference about what happens if you if you do then we are then we simply point out that well look it's it's very clearly made of of of, of a set of uh, interacting chemicals at some point we'll be able to reconstitute one so what's the what's the issue if you don't then you have to explain to me what happens in embryonic development where you actually go very slowly and 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 um gradually from a single cell into whatever it is that that we are and again there is no magic lightning flash that converts the chemistry of the oocyte into the mind of 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 the of the of the adult human so this continuity you you can't escape it what we owe is not a story about magic uh, bright lines we owe a story about scaling and the other the other uh, thing that i think is is really curious and um it's kind of um I don't know if it's my if it's my uh, bringing uh, with with too much science fiction or what, but I, I find it really amazing. There was a there was a great scene in um, there's a, a movie called Ex Machina, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and there's a great scene in that movie where the protagonist is is now so confused by this by this AI that he's been dealing with that he's standing there in front of a mirror and he starts cutting his hand because uh, his arm because he wants to see if he is a robot too right and it's very important to him it's uh, this is this is this is critical to you know to him he's you know it's very stressful um and i get emails all the time also from people who say I, i've 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 read your paper i understand now that I'm, I'm i'm a walking bag of cells now i'm depressed i don't know what to do with myself this is this is terrible right and and then i mean just let's let's just unpack this this cutting your arm thing so what that means is if you were to find you so so you cut open your arm and you find a bunch of cogs and gears you've had you know i don't know 40 50 however many uh, years of experience in your own skin uh, be, being an agent uh, exerting effort towards uh, various outcomes and having moral quandaries and 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 having you know quaily and all these things and when you see those cogs and gears what you're going to decide is none of that was real because i am committed to the idea that cogs and gears can't support it this is this is so bizarre to me, and it's bizarre because we don't know what cogs and gears can and can't support. You know why? Why are you so so attached to uh, protoplasm and proteins and whatever else uh, you know is inside you over over what something else that you might find? What do you think you know about those things that overrides your primary experience as a human? It's just it's it's amazing to me that that what people naturally tend to say is. Okay, well then I guess I'm not real. I'm not important. I can't do all of the amazing things I was going to do. Versus, wow, I guess I just learned something great about cogs and gears. Look at that. Uh, you know, I guess cogs and gears can do it. Uh, not not too much more shocking than finding out that proteins and you know and and, and carbohydrates and whatever else uh, is in our bodies can do it. Yeah, and neurons firing. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but 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 people are so committed to to simple to well to two things to 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 first of all to the idea that if you if your parts obey the laws of physics then then you are somehow reduced which i think you know this this allegiance to the to a low level of description i think is completely arbitrary dennis noble does a really nice job um in his work on uh against uh, privileged levels of causation and things like that uh and and then the idea that uh that we know what various kinds of materials and architectures can do we have we have absolutely no idea you know we need we, this 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 actual field is at a despite the rest of science is at a very young um stage we we do not know there are emergent not just emergent complexity so 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 everybody studies emergent complexity that's been around for a long time it's not emergent complexity here it's it's emergent goal directedness and emergent cognition and that happens in even in very simple systems it surprises us constantly we are not good at predicting it we are not good at creating it yet uh well i should say we may create it un unwittingly all the time and so people who say you know i, I know what this is uh, because i made it I, I think that's a that's a really dangerous idea because because you don't know what something is just because you made it or because um, people say this about you know language models or whatever just because you know the parts that went into it we do not yet know what it is what it can do and and how important is the inner perspective and what kind of inner perspective it has.
So um, yeah, I think I think I think a lot of a lot of humility here is needed, and uh, a letting go of this idea that the right level of description is chemistry. And you know, I think it's 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 fine that that's there. It does not tell the whole story in any practical way. Yeah, thank you. You need to understand that these things run and operate at different levels and interlocking le levels. Yeah. Well, well, just just you know, very, very specifically, uh, the business of uh, the business of physics and determinism, right? One of the key issues here is that determinism is well and good if what you're interested in doing is looking backwards. So something has happened, and you're going to tell a mechanistic story of why it happened. And you can always do that. That's always on the table. So you zoom down and you say, look, this person did that because these neurotransmitters zigged and zagged, and, and they did that because of the electron forces and, and all of this, this stuff. Right? You, you can always tell a story going backwards. But that isn't what we're interested in, both as, as humans and scientists. We're interested in going forwards, as in what can and should I do next, and what can I invent, or how can I um, increase my understanding next? And that is a completely different kind of task. So, so here's here's one of my favorite examples: um, uh, the game of life, cellular automaton, right? So you've got three simple rules that dictate uh, how each is, the state of each cell is going to be on or off uh, based on what its neighbors do. Okay, so just and it's a just, simple two-dimensional grid, isn't it? With completely simple. Yep. Super simple, two two dimensional grid. The cells are on or off, uh, and and it's it's fully deterministic. Okay, there's not even any stochasticity here. So 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 every cell in every tick of the clock, each each cell becomes uh, you know on or off based on how many neighbors it has. That's it. Now 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 we we know, and and if you if anybody in the audience hasn't seen it, look it up, um, and and you can see these amazing things that happen, right? So emergent complexity is very strong here. And if anyone hasn't played with it, I'd recommend go and find some of the online tools because you can play with this stuff yourself. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely amazing, and 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 so now, so now, look, you can imagine being a uh, reductionist determinist about this world, and saying so. So, for example, one of the things that happens in this world is there are things called gliders. So, gliders are patterns that are a particular shape, and the shape moves across. Now, to be clear, nothing actually moves across. The cells are just turning on and off. But the pattern itself, it's like a wave, in the you know, the pattern itself moves, and those those are called gliders. So now. You could be a reductionist about this, and you can say, look, there are no gliders. All there is are the individual cells, and I can tell you precisely which cells are going to come on and off. And the fact that you think you see gliders is an epiphenomenon. It, it, it does nothing in the system. There are no gliders. All it is, is is the rules. And that isn't exactly wrong, because the physics of the world are quite clear, but it's absolutely limiting in the following way. If you don't believe in gliders, you can you can predict the next state of whatever state I set up in the game. You can tell me exactly what's going to happen. But next, there's no escape from that level of determinism. But here's what you won't ever do. You won't ever build a Turing machine made out of gliders, as somebody did. Somebody designed a pattern that does computations by sending gliders back and forth. If you don't believe in gliders, you're not going to do that. It yeah. closes off that level of inventiveness. So looking so 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 a key thing about these these higher levels is that they enable you to have a more a richer, richer relationship with the system going forward, not just explain what happens backwards after somebody's done the interesting work of preparing a system for you. Yeah, it's fascinating. And and that idea of a universal Turing machine is is a essentially a computer that can carry out any computation, you know, given enough time and enough resources. So and this is from individual cells blinking on and off based on a super simple rule set clicking through four yeah. over time. And and the other and, and I I don't know if this is right, but I like the difference between this idea of determinism looking backwards and looking forwards, because in a sense, it's the same deterministic mechanism going forwards. Yeah. But for it to be useful, we need to actually shortcut whatever that deterministic computation is going to be for us to be able to predict. And to do that, we need to understand patterns at different levels. And sometimes we can't do it. Um, you know, sometimes the thing is computationally irreducible such that the only way of finding out what's going to happen is to let the process run or to create a simulation that's so perfect, you've basically just duplicated reality, right? So, so, yeah. so even if it's conceptually deterministic in the future, that doesn't necessarily help you anticipate. And and the idea of these high level concepts, as you said, give you useful tools in your relation to these phenomena to you know anticipate maybe the future and understand the patterns. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 control what happens next. So so as a simple and and some of these systems, the cool thing about uh, living and other kinds of uh, systems of this type is that they offer this kind of shortcut. So so here's a simple example. Imagine that you had a rat and you wanted him to do a simple circus trick. Uh, you know, I don't know, sit on a little bicycle or something. 
one thing that you might do from the level of chemistry and physics is you might say, okay, so I want the muscles to move in this particular way. I need to calculate which neuronal impulses are going to move exactly these muscles to do it. I need to trace it back into the brain, figure out all the circuits, how, how everything is going to um, you know, propagate through the brain and figure out which pixels on the retina I need to stimulate with various uh, images that sh you know, shown to the rat to get him to get on the little bicycle. Okay. If you try to actually calculate, so, so that's completely um, computationally intractable. If you try to do that, the sun, you know, the sun will burn out long before before you actually get it done. But 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 there's an amazing thing here, which is that you can just train the rat. And that's because the rat has a particular uh, cognitive causal architecture that hides all that stuff. And it takes on all the complexity of figuring out how should my internal parts be uh, uh, arranged in order for, meaning, meaning all the different neurotransmitters and everything else, how should that all be arranged in order to achieve a particular goal? So the way you do this is you get the buy-in of the rat. You make your goal the rat's goal, and then the rat does all the uh, the hard work for you. You don't have to calculate all this stuff forward. So one of the things that understanding these um, the large scale capabilities of your of your system is critical in having a productive uh, interaction of a, a predictive, powerful, productive interaction going forward. And this is something that I think is the rate limiting step right now for regenerative medicine. Because in in biology and and and, re, and biomedicine, the standard operating assumption is that cells are mechanical agents. All the excitement is about the hardware. So so CRISPR, genomic uh, re, you know genomic editing, pathway rewiring, everything is down at the level of hardware, and that closes off a huge number of potentially uh, really powerful interventions, like which things are we're doing in our lab, like cellular training, um, uh, exploiting cellular problem solving. Because if you insist on uh, viewing systems from that low level perspective, not, not that it's wrong. It's, I mean, that perspective is there. It's there for you to take, but it limits you. You know, reductionism is well named. It reduces what you can do. It reduces your ability to really exploit what's, 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 what's powerful about these systems. And we are leaving so much on the table by uh, refusing to test out the tools uh, the interaction tools that we have and and that have been used for you know I mean, this is this is why humans trained in dogs and horses for thousands of years knowing zero neuroscience right it's because it's because it's because these systems make it uh, accessible make make that that whole process you know the goal rewriting process so accessible they offer that beautiful interface that learning interface so cells and tissues do this too and and if you refuse to to test those hypotheses you leave a lot on the table yeah thank you so these ideas of sentience and consciousness are very important to you still. They're not things you discard, but you refuse to say they're binary, they're not on or off switches. If there are boundaries, they're fuzzy. And in your sense, there may not even be a boundary at all. Ultimately, it may just be a question of degree across every possible system. But that doesn't destroy their meaningfulness because there's a sense, I think, with some people who have a very expansive view of consciousness that they either reify it in some sense you know they again they pull it away from the physical and you know that can lead people into again back into some sort of mystical or soul-based ways of thinking about it or they declare it universal as some might say you would because you're saying well it's it's a spectrum and there's no real end to the spectrum so in a sense maybe everything shares in these characteristics to some degree um, but by declaring it universal, they almost destroy what's meaningful about the concept. Yeah, um, that's, and, and I, it sort of flattens flattens it out. And I don't think you're doing either because you're you're recognizing that while you don't want it to make it binary, there's still something distinctive that you can describe in terms of how how we relate to these entities and and what these un, these concepts can help us understand about these entities. So it retains their meaning. Yeah, it, it it doesn't just it doesn't just it's not just for explaining. It is essential for uh, it is essential and useful. My my claim is that I, ideas about uh, cognitive capacities in unfamiliar contexts and unfamiliar embodiments are essential. They're practical and they're essential. This is this is uh, this is not um, uh, philosophy. It's not um, you know some kind of feel good uh, mysticism. My my claim is, and it's it's a testable claim that we've been testing for now for for twenty years successfully. Is that uh, it, it? It helps you do better in in the empirical world. I mean, my the the best thing I hope my lab does is 
uh, what 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 I want, you know, on on their best day, what I think we're doing is taking these ideas from deep philosophy that people have argued about for thousands of years and bringing them to the bedside, to the clinic. And 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 these things, these ideas are empirically essential to get the kind of outcomes that you want. So so that's I, you know, I don't know what more what more um, we can say about uh, why yeah. these, why these ideas are real because by taking that inner perspective, by asking what do cells remember, what do they care about, what is their the size of their goals, what are their goals. These are questions that lead directly to therapeutics. They lead to work in regenerative medicine, in cancer. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what more evidence we could have that these are that these things are critical. And the other issue is that this this idea that if we if we let if if we start to apply the tools that we use with cognitive systems, we try to apply them elsewhere. That 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 kind of leads to some sort of sliding creep that um, devalues our own uh, uh cognition and and our own uh, majesty uh that that's a weird um zero sum game that i don't buy into i i am in no way diminished by i don't feel in any way diminished by the idea that there are uh it, it, it basically an infinitude of other minds highly diverse minds um endless sentient forms throughout the universe no i think but certainly here on earth that are also having experiences that 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 strive and suffer and uh, to to various degrees. I don't think that diminishes us at all. It's it's to, to me it it seems childish to me to 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 somehow pin pin our um the quality of what we have on the fact that no one else has it. That that just seems I, I don't know why we need to make that move. I think yeah. I think what I th I think what we have is essential. I think understanding it is essential so that we can scale it up. I would like to scale my cognitive capacity. I would like uh, humanity to scale its cognitive capacity more specifically, not just the intelligence, but the um, but the the radius of concern, of care, you know, um, and uh, of of compassion. I think we need to scale that up, and you only do that if you understand what it is that you're scaling. You've done the perfect segue into our second big question about the ethics. And what I might do is collapse these questions of what matters and who matters just into one, because. In the big questions of ethics, in a sense, there are there are a bunch of different choices. You can you can take a nihilist route where you sort of give up on the idea. You can take a relativist approach where you think about ethics as just uh, sets of rules that groups have negotiated in a more transactional, relational sense. But there's no real truth of the matter about whether those rules do good or bad. You could follow a divine command theory, going back to our early conversation, where you could turn to the the Bible or the Quran or some other source of supernatural authority and go basically following those rules or being obedient to that deity is the ultimate arbiter of what's good or bad. But if we put those aside, and personally I think we should, whatever sort of moral philosophy we have, whether it's about rights and deontology or whether it's about consequences and utilitarianism, whether it's about feminist care ethic where we have relations of care, whether it's about virtues, you know, whatever the system is, they do all seem to share a sort of common sense ethical core, which is that somehow morality is about whether and how we care about others. And the obvious question then is, okay, well, who gets to count as an other? That's really our who matters question. Um, and again, I and this podcast have a bias because we tend to focus on this idea of sentience as being the qualifier in that for a, an entity to count as another, they need to have their own perspective within which they value their own experiences, states, interests, uh, and lives, I guess. And because they value those things themselves, that's the rationale for us also caring about them. Because in a way, if morality is about caring about others, let's care about all of the others that have their own perspective and so qualify as others. So it's almost a little bit circular. But anyway, that's, that's I guess, the, the starting point from a sentiocentric ethic is to care about all of those others. But I'd be really interested in your own thinking about either the, the sort of foundations of ethics, right, wrong, and good and bad, but also given what we've talked about so far, how you think about moral scope and who gets to count and what are the implications of that and what, what journey have you gone on through your life so far and thinking about those big questions yeah well uh it, you know it's it's uh, somewhat beyond my pay grade to try to lay out a, a global uh a theory of, of ethics for everybody else and so on that's uh, I, I won't try to do that but uh, but i will i will give you some thoughts and and, and how i think about um, these things uh a couple of things first i think it's it's important to 
um, not pretend that once we understand how sentient something is, we are automatically good at treating it ethically. Okay, so so we know that's not the case. We, you know, oh, yeah. fact, factory farming. Uh, you know, we we all know we all know pigs are are um, pigs value uh, their own ex their experience that they feel pain all that, and yet here we are. So 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 I think what what we know and and how we treat them are not unfortunately the same thing but 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 certainly um we should we should have a a principled way of um apportioning uh our relationships with with other with other beings of all different kinds i think that uh moving forward in in uh in uh, assuming assuming we all you know survive uh, the next few decades i think moving forward uh, for for the flourishing of humanity of ecosystems of other beings on earth really requires uh, the deep lessons of diverse intelligence. I think we need to understand that there is no such thing as a magical standard human that is the the, the subject of all these you know philosophical um, arguments. For, first of all, because w because evolutionarily we have a lineage going back to single cells. So anything that you think about human uh, uh, responsibilities, or whatever. Well, how about a human of two hundred thousand years ago? How about five hundred thousand years ago? You know, where where was it? Right? Where? How did it get here? And so on. Uh, so all of those things are uh, continua. The same thing is true of embryonic development. You can ask how these things showed up for, in your journey from from an OSI to a to a being, and uh, all of the. Um, uh, the current uh, discussions of uh, neuroatypical humans and uh, uh, you know the bodily modifications that some people do these things are going to be l l laughable to the f to the humans of the next couple generations in their in their m minor sort of um, degree their, their timid degree I mean you're you're going to have humans that are so modified in body and mind you know cyborgs hybrids with various biological and technological changes that it's going to be completely obvious and you know right now we're 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 kind of lulled into a fault well we have been for 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 centuries lulled into a false sense of security in the sense that it was easy you know before you could say does it speak if it speaks then it's it's it, like us and even and even that humanity failed you know we've we've we were we were really terrible to each other for for much more much smaller differences but 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 you could you know you could say um where did you come from meaning were you evolved or did you come from a factory and you could sort of knock on something and if you hear a metallic clanging sound you say okay now we we, we know we know how we're going to deal with this and if and if you heard you know some kind of soft um and kind of a thud then then that's something else that those categories were never any good, but they served us kind of okay for a long time. Th those are gone. Th those are those are gone now. They're going to be left in the dust by the next couple of a couple of decades. It's going to be essential that we learn to have an ethical. Um, I call it synthbiosis with other beings that are nowhere with us on the tree of life. They are modified in body and mind, and what you look like and where you come from simply cannot be the foundation for how we're going to relate to each other and again science fiction dealt with this a long time ago um uh, but 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 somehow uh people today um have, have lost sight of some of those things you know again the current debates over ai it's very easy to say that language models aren't this and aren't that and and i'm not a defender of any particular view of sentience and language models Although more generally, I don't believe we really know what we have once we've made it. But 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 the thing is, those kind of language models—they're so different from us that it's very easy for people to say, "Oh, that's not that's 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 not the things we want to care about." What what are you going to do when you're confronted with humans that have you know, fifty-one percent of their brain replaced by by various silicon appliances, and uh, and 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 they, you know they're they're linked together with other people and also a few uh, a few AIs and some things like that. So all of this is coming. Uh, it is um, we 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 are going to have to develop um, a more a better better more principled ethical frameworks for for dealing with it with with beings that are just very alien uh you know in in their construction and so that means that you need um, frameworks to understand what's in what what do all these beings have in common and this is something that a few years ago i i developed this notion of a cognitive light cone to try to <clears throat> get away from the idea of of what kind of material embodiment you're in and instead focus on what are the things you care about what's the si what what is the size of the biggest goals you can um you can uh, you can pursue, and regardless of your of your embodiment or implementation or origin story, and that kind of a thing at least begins to uh, give us a, a a way to to apportion uh, our degree of moral concern to beings that are capable of um, uh, pursuing goals and uh, and and having you know various kinds of 
uh, competencies of navigating um, problem spaces and 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 suffering when those goals are not um, are not made, uh, are not are not reached. So that that for 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 that reason, uh, I think um, you know I th I think I think the the diversity of what we who and what we think counts is going to be enormous, and and this business of language models and and so on is just a, it's a distraction from a much much deeper puzzle. Yeah, thank you. And one of my previous guests, Josh Gellis, has done quite a lot of work in that space about thinking about potential artificial intelligences and sentiences and so on and actually he's quite challenging about the idea of sentience because he's worried that it's seen too much as a sort of easily isolatable property that we will then deny to for example artificial intelligence and robots and so on and he prefers a much more relational approach which we can go back and forth about the risks and the challenges of that but one thing i do agree with him and I think you, is that we're going to be forced into working this stuff out, whether we like it or not. And it, I think it will open up and radicalize the way we think about what it is to be another and, and, and that need to appreciate radically different perspectives from different beings. But, but I'm, I was really glad you mentioned animal agriculture because one of the frustrations with many people who are involved in sentientism or as a worldview is that there's a frustration in the current zeitgeist that people seem really excited about talking about artificial intelligences and artificial sentience and, and whether robots could ever feel something and become moral patients. But people seem to conveniently skip over the hundreds of billions, if not trillions, if we include aquatic non-human sentient beings that we brutally exploit today. And it's, and it's a really interesting case study because I think when you take a naturalistic epistemology and you understand the facts of what farming and fishing are like not just factory farming but all of it and you take the ethical perspective of the beings that are going through those processes it quite easily leads you to a point of a quite extreme ethical condemnation of what's going on in those situations but our society has trained us to think they're so normal that there's a, 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 a brutal clash between you know if you like the epistemology and the sentiocentric ethic and today's social norms so i was, I was thank you for mentioning that i, I mean a so, so a couple a couple of things there what one is that um yeah i mean you're absolutely right of course uh in in uh uh in talking about um these ais uh and instead of uh the problems with the with the existing uh, life forms is, is is a huge issue it also comes up when people say oh wow we're you know we're going to make these high level intelligences and who knows how they'll be raised and what they're going to do in the future? I mean, you've heard of having kids, right? Like, like I'm, I'm just, you know, we do this all the time. We, we have a, an enormous amount of guaranteed high level uh, uh, intelligences that are created all the time, and a huge diversity of of good and and bad um, environments that they're raised in. We have a very limited. Um, ability to make sure that they are they have a good embodied experience and are aligned with our values and some of them go on to do wonderful things and some of them go on to you know to to do horrible things Th that's already an issue we, we we already have that the thing with um so so these in many in many ways these problems are not new problems brought on by ai they're perennial um existential problems that humanity has felt it has faced forever you know in terms of being supplanted by the next generation that finds your values uh, you know irrelevant and uh, how much control do you want over how your neighbor is raising their kids and all these kinds of things this is this is um this has been with us with us for the longest time the one the one unique thing about uh about um ai intelligences though is that they can be copied in a much easier fashion they can be reproduced and copied in a much easier fashion than than real animals and I think that um, now, now while there are some good uh, uh, I, uh, debates about whether something that actually can be copied it, it even counts in this case, so you know, um, there's there's a few arguments that, that that that's not an issue, but 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 I'm not sure yet. And I think that for that for that reason, because there's just going to be such an uncountable number of intelligences uh, of the software variety, whether embodied or not, it's something that we need to we need to consider. You know, and and I'm hopeful that uh, with the advent of uh, different uh, different ways to grow um, food, proteins, and so on, we're going to eventually completely get, get just you know do away with with animal farming and so on. But the creation of novel um, uh, uh, synthetic uh, organisms is is only going to increase, and I mean you know digital or embodied or not. So yeah. so that's we you know I, I I think we need to we need to focus on both sides of both sides of that equation. Yeah, I agree, agree. Um, and I don't know if you've your thinking on that has led you down the path of boycotting animal agriculture and its products so far, or whether I can help you offline on that path. But 
Yeah. Why don't we, yes. Why, why don't we, why don't we talk offline? <laughs> that's good. That's good. So the, the other ethical question I wanted to touch on with you is how that bears on your own work in the lab, because you do work with a variety of different entities, animal and non. How does that play in? Because you're into your choices because you're working with some very simple organisms and you're working with more complex organisms as well that would have richer experiences. How, how do you think about that? Again, I won't take you through it in depth, but I'm interested in sort of simple perspective you take on animals and research. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, first, just to say that animal use and research is incredibly uh, stringently regulated. So, so, so in order to do the things that somebody would do when they go fishing for an afternoon, we have uh, three months of paperwork and, and oversight by, by veterinarians and ethicists and all that. So, so, so there is, there's a huge amount of oversight as there should, you know, as there should be, I'm, I'm in full favor of that. Um, but this is, this is something I think that's, that's really important and it gets to this issue of, of, of what matters. Um, a lot of folks see scientific ethics in the following way. Everything's great and you scientists better not screw it up. Right. So, so, so here's a long list of things we don't want you to do. Uh, we don't want this. We don't want that. Uh, don't make things worse. Now that could, I, I suppose, could have been a, a viable worldview when people believe that our current world is in some way set up uh, in the right way for us. In other words, it is the best possible world. Everything is great. Now, now don't screw it up. What we now know is that, th that, that that's not the world we live in. We, we, we are the process of a meandering evolutionary uh, path. Uh, evolution, does, as far as I can tell, does not optimize for any of our values. It doesn't optimize for happiness, for intelligence, for any of that stuff. No. We are where evolution dumped us with all of our ridiculous susceptibilities to bacteria, viruses, lower back pain, uh, you know, uh, stray cosmic rays that might have hit a DNA molecule um, during development. And now, you know, your potential is radically limited. When you broaden that sc scope out to all of the potentially sentient beings, that it just becomes even starker, right? If there is some telos to this universe, it's a pretty brutal one. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is. It is. There's no doubt. And so I, I'm not even a clinician, but the amount of emails that I get every day from people with the most unbelievable examples of, of biomedical suffering is just is just incredible. So I think it is utter uh, moral cowardice to focus on what we shouldn't do, um, and uh, and at, as uh, as opposed to our duty now that we have for the first time, I guess, on Earth, we have the um, the ability to actually rationally uh, approach these matters to try to uh, to try to guarantee a better. Uh, embodiment for uh, for sentient beings on Earth, um, the, the you know the number of people that are suffering because of our ignorance, because we don't know what to do, and also because of our um, our timidity and our and our um, um, eh, our unwillingness to take responsibility for we, we are the ones that are now uh, it is on us now to uh, to to improve this for people. Um, and 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 not just people for ecosystems for for other beings for uh just just the the amount of the amount of ignorance and inaction that are that is letting uh a sentient beings suffer worldwide is is incredible and so i think that uh i i take i take animal use ethics extremely seriously but i think to the extent that it is our responsibility to relieve the suffering worldwide science has to go on and we have to do experiments that are going to enable us to improve embodied exper experience for 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 all um this is uh just uh you know we, the, the buddhists have this have this concept of an inauspicious birth and it's this idea that that in one of your many lifetimes you're born in a body during which you just can't make progress towards uh, you know towards enlightenment i i think at this point uh, and i know this is a this is a a controversial view but i think basically right now every birth is an inauspicious birth all of us are are limited by the vagaries of of random mutation and selection and all these dumb things and viruses all, all these dumb things that have no one's best interest and i think in the future I, I i sort of sometimes i sort of imagine this dialogue that uh you know uh children uh in the future are going to have with their teachers you know you know the kind of thing where where you tell the kids yeah and we wrote on chalkboards you know and we didn't have uh cell phones and like what you know and and so so they're gonna say you, you, you're telling me you would just have to stay in whatever body you randomly got. And if you had some sort of defect, you just have to live that way. And if you're, you know, and, and if, and if the IQ and the lifespan that you were born with wasn't enough to fulfill your goals, you, that, that that's it. You just have to, you know, that was your bad luck. That's, that will be unthinkable to, to a modern, uh, you know, modern, uh, humans going forward. 
And in a way, that's a that's a beautiful link into the final question, which is how do we make a better future? Which is what you know, what are the promises of these types of research and and thinking? Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, ultimately from the kind of the bigger picture uh, for me is is freedom of embodiment. I think that every sentient being should have the and and we need to we we should we should offer assistance in the same way that we offer assistance to beings via education via uh, you know support of every ever of of every kind. We should be in a position to offer uh, the ability for sentient beings to have better. Uh, embodiments to fulfill their their potential, their goals, and so on. Practically speaking, what that uh, requires is um, complete control over growth and form. It means that we need to really be able to uh, direct what it is that cells build. Now, right now, that just looks like regenerative medicine in the sense that if we knew how to get cells to build specific uh, anatomical structures, then birth defects, traumatic injuries, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all these things would 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 go away if we could communicate our goals to groups of cells. And, and this is something that we and some other labs are working on now is, is this kind of, you know, this, this idea of an anatomical compiler where you can just specify the shape of the, of the structure that you want and it gives stimuli to cells to, to make them grow exactly that. And again, linking, linking to what you said before, this is different from the classical ideas of genetic engineering or, you know, what you do with CRISPR and so on. This is a different mode of engagement with a, a system. Yeah, the goal the goal is is similar because because certainly people uh, uh, you know uh, at the time that genetics was getting off the ground, this is a vision that people had then too. That if we understood the genetics, we could control the shape. I I, I think we have a much more um, practical path to it because I think the genetics specifies the hardware that every cell gets to have, so the the proteins. But uh, as we know from from the advance, advances of computer science and information technology, programming at the level of hardware, while possible, it's really hard. And if you have good hardware that's actually reprogrammable and offers high level interfaces, you know, you might say APIs, which I think is exactly what, what it offers, then then you can do this in a much better way, specifically by uh, honoring uh, the agency of the cells and tissues and being a collaborator with them. We, 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 don't, we don't micromanage our cells and tissues here. Um, in my group, we, we basically collaborate with them and, and, uh, and um, modulate their goals and take advantage of their uh, competencies, their problem-solving capacities, their memories, and so on. So I think, I think that's, that is a way uh, to move the field forward much faster. I think that CRISPR and those kinds of things are going to flatten out. Uh, soon, because because after you've picked the low hanging fruit of single gene diseases, the next question is going to be, well, what genes do you edit to make the changes, the anatomical changes you want? And it's and development's not reversible in that way. You can't just you can't just uh, figure out what uh, you know, in any easy way what what to edit. So, uh, I th I think uh, taking advantage of the of the um, interfaces that cells use to hack each other is 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 critical. But initially, that just looks like reprogramming tumors and regrowing limbs and. Um, uh, growing new organs and so on, all, all of which, by the way, we've done here at, in in various model model systems. But ultimately, it leads to freedom of embodiment. It means that if you want to have a different embodiment, you can. And if you decide you want to change it, you should be able to do that too. There is there is no reason any of us should be stuck in uh, in the embodiment that we that we got, including including IQ and lifespan and all those all those things, uh, because those things were not chosen with your welfare in mind. They were uh, they were the, a long process uh, that would, uh, shaped by forces that don't honor any of our values. Yeah, thank you. It's quite quite a vision, and it will, will link to some of the things I've touched on with some of the um, people who are interested in the transhumanist space, like David Pearson and, and so on as well. And again, it's that freedom of embodiment for human and non-human sentient beings that is, to put it a different way shaped by their own values and aspirations and experiences rather than constrained by inherited biology and, and freeing from some of those constraints. But some of my audience will love that sort of vision and see the potential. Others will be nervous about classic problem of human hubris and intervening where we're not really ready to intervene. What do you think of the risk profile and approach you're taking? Are there, are there risks we need to watch out for that? We need to build in for, for sure there are going to be risks but but i'm pushing in the very ob opposite direction of of the of the hubris i m my argument isn't that uh everything is great and then in an effort to um make it even better we're going to screw things up and and we may screw some things up it's a pretty pretty inevitable my my argument is that things are so bad 
right now for so many that it is a moral uh, imperative. You, we, we do not have the luxury of saying, don't do this. Uh, wait. Inaction is a choice too, right? Yeah, exactly right. The, the opportunity cost of doing nothing is, is, is massive. Um, it's absolutely massive. And, you know, uh, this, this, this idea that, uh, that, that, we, you know, we don't have to do anything because we can let, let things go, um, how, how they are now, it, that, that's, that's simply not acceptable. That, 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 uh, that opportunity cost is, is, is too huge. So, so yes, we're going to make, um, we're going to make mistakes, but anybody who, uh, you know, we know from our personal lives, if, 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 if the thing that you are most optimizing is to never make a mistake. What what's going to be the value of 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 your life and all the you know all the the huffing and puffing uh, you know that we do during our life um, our our brief time here uh, what what's the goal you know if if that's I mean obviously you want to minimize making mistakes but but there should be a constructive I I believe there should be a constructive element to this where you have a you have a purpose to elevate uh, and and help others and that is not going to happen by focusing on the um, on the things we shouldn't do and just 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 more broadly I I ask you know people who focus on this like negative uh, kind of a risk, uh, risk-based uh, perspective. What, what does humanity look like a hundred years from now? Are we still, are we still getting lower back pain and bad knees and, and dying into our eighties once we've gotten this, you know, a little bit of wisdom under our belts, like that's it. And, and, you know, and, and if you happen to, uh, you know, some, some, some cosmic ray or something, uh, hits, uh, hits one of your chromosomes, then th are we still living like that? I mean, I can't imagine. I, I just, that, that, that would seem such a, like such a waste of this incredible gift of, of intelligence and compassion that we have that, uh, it, it seems ludicrous to me, but, but anybody, I, I think, I think people should spend time painting the future that they do want, you know, um, everybody's already paid, you know, written down all the things they don't want. That's fine. Now, now, now paint me a picture of what, what do you want? Where, where should we be a hundred years from now? Yeah, thank you. I'm a sucker for a bit of utopian thinking. I know you're a fellow sci-fi fan as well. And some people will use that as a way of discarding some of the ideas you're working on and saying it's just sci-fi. But I think sci-fi has got a lot to teach us. I've, I often find better philosophy in, in sci-fi than I do in actual philosophy. And one of the things about sci-fi is it's very good at sort of intuitive sentientist stance because uh, it's so common and just natural and even unthinking in most science fiction stories to recognize the salience of sentient beings that are radically different from ourselves. And I think there's a lesson there we can take too. So, yeah. For, for sure. And, you know, sci-fi to me, if, if somebody says, uh, this is just sci-fi, my question is very simple. Are you saying it's impossible or are you just saying it's going to take a while? Like that's yeah. it. There are certain things that may be, I don't know what those would be, but there are certain things that may be physically impossible. Fine. Everything else is just a time to, then, then we're just quibbling over a timetable. Every, every, everything that's possible is going to be done. And there's dystopian sci-fi, but there's also utopian sci-fi. So yeah. yeah, like I say, paint paint those pictures. Well, it's been an inspirational conversation. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Mike. What's the best way of people following you, finding out more about your work? I'll include links in the show notes, of course. But where would you? Where's the main place you point people? Yeah, the official uh, uh, lab website that has all of the kind of uh, peer-reviewed um, hard stuff is uh, drmike11.org. One word, drmike11.org. The more speculative, uh, you know, the photography, the prose, and all that stuff, and so just some thoughts that I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't put in a scientific paper is at um, thoughtforms.life. It's a blog called thoughtforms.life. And I'm on Twitter at, uh, at drmike11. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. And I'll follow up with some vegan tips offline. So. Cool. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on Sentientism. It's been a pleasure, Mike. Take care. Thank you so Enjoy much. the rest of your day. It. Thank you. You too. Please stay in touch.